Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we are kicking off our third alumni panel of the Made in HFA series. So today's alumni panel is themed educators in the making. Um, we've been joined by three different College of HFA alumni who are going to chat with us about their experience teaching a variety of different subjects at a variety of different levels. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into about 45 minutes of organized questions, and then we will leave the last 10 to 15 minutes, as always, for you in the audience to go ahead and ask any questions that you may have, um, or if we have some faculty members present who want to give a little shout out to maybe their students who are in the room, you are more than welcome to do that. So first up today, we have Kelly Telebrico. Kelly grew up in San Diego, California. She earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics at Chico State in 2006, a master's degree in Fine Arts and Ceramics at San Diego State University in 2010, and her California teaching credential in 2015. As an educator with over 10 years of experience at the middle school, high school, and college level, Kelly strives to foster a strong sense of community and personal development in her classroom. Currently, as a tenured full-time ceramics teacher at Coronado High School, Kelly teaches beginning and advanced level ceramics classes that balance sculpture and pottery with contemporary art approaches and traditional craft. Her classes cover a wide variety of topics, including ceramic art history, glaze formulation, professional studio practices, maintenance, public art projects, and community service projects. Her philosophy is to make it relevant, productive, and fun, and then you'll love your job every day. Thank you for joining us, Kelly. Hi. Can you let Glad everyone know where you are streaming in from today? Yeah, so I'm in my classroom at Coronado High School, which is in San Diego, California. Wonderful, thank you. Next up, we have Cecilia Romero. Cecilia completed her undergraduate education in 2018 with a Bachelor of Arts in English, option in English education. She went on to earn her Master of Arts in Education and a single subject teaching credential, all from Chico State. Since completing her degrees, Cecilia has gained two years of professional experience in education. She currently teaches English language development courses at Live Oak High School, as well as serving as the English language development coordinator for the school. Hello, Cecilia. Hi, everyone. Where are you joining us from today? So I'm actually streaming from Oroville from my home. We're on spring break, so I'm not in my classroom today. <laughs> well, thank you for spending a small piece of your break with us. We appreciate it. Last but not least, we have Bianca Morphine, who graduated from Chico State with her BA in Spanish in 2015. She went on to become a student teacher at Chico High School and completed the credential program in 2018. Bianca is currently in her third year of teaching Spanish, levels one, two, and three at Gridley High School. Bianca has always enjoyed working with adolescents and knew she wanted to pursue a career in education. Her interest in teaching Spanish was affirmed during her undergraduate studies at Chico State when she had the privilege of working at Chico High School as an intern. Bianca currently teaches at a school rich with diversity where most of the student body consists of second language learners, many of which come from migrant parents. She has gained useful experiences in learning to provide detailed modifications for both excelling and struggling students. Bianca creates a project-based learning environment in her classroom and is motivated to promote culture and diversity to create a learning community on campus that is relevant to student needs. Hi, Bianca. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Where are you coming from today? So same, I'm also on spring break right now, um, but I'm typically in my classroom at Gridley High School, but I'm in Chico for right now. Nice, this is actually the first alumni panel we've done of the series where all participants are in the state. The last two panels, we've had people in New York and Texas. So we have a nice local crew here. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go ahead and dive into our questions if everyone is ready to go. So Kelly, we are gonna go ahead and kick off with you on this question. Can you tell us what inspired you or led you to pursue a crew, a career, excuse me, in teaching and how you found yourself in the position you're currently in today? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, I think, Firstly, I was, what drew me to education was just seeing my professor's lifestyles when I was at Chico, like being able to see my teachers like Cameron and Sue and Mike Murphy and just how they were able to interact with their, their students and 
I just, I just was kind of like, I like your life. I want that too. And um, so I knew I wanted to go into education. I thought higher education at first. And then later in my career, um, I started to move more towards um, high school and my mom taught middle school for 25 years. And so she was always kind of in the background kind of pushing me to go for like a high school credential. But I think I always wanted to teach, um, just be in this kind of environment. Wonderful, thank you. Cecilia, we'll kind of turn to you. How did you find yourself in your current teaching career? Yeah, so I grew up in like a low income community and I attended like underfunded public schools. So needless to say is I didn't really have positive experiences during my K through 12 education. And I wanted to help rewrite uh, similar narratives by giving students access to a rigorous and culturally relevant curriculum and uh, to an educator who is empathetic and supportive. And the best way that I knew how to do that was to become a teacher and sort of just give back to my community and give back to students who might have been in my similar situation. Sometimes our strongest motivations can come from some not so positive experience. So it is yes. awesome to see you, you know, taking that be the change saying and putting that into action. Yeah. Bianca, can you share with us how you found yourself in a teaching position? Well, actually, I think mine's kind of a mix of Kelly and Cecilia. Um, mine began with, I always knew I wanted to work with young adults or young kids. Um, I just didn't know where exactly I fit in with that. Uh, so being a Spanish major, my professors actually put me in a, well, we had a class where we were placed inside of the high school, um, a specific high school. I luckily got Chico High and, and it was just an incredible experience being able to kind of work side by side, side by side with a teacher, not necessarily in the credential program yet. And I just, I saw how incredible it was to teach a foreign language or a second language. And I just loved it. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the aspect of language acquisition. And same as Cecilia had mentioned, uh, I remember growing up, I didn't have such a positive experience. Um, and go figure, actually, I'm teaching now at the high school I went to. And so a big inspiration of why I wanted to be a teacher was because I wanted to bring a teacher or te like teachers that could kind of be they could they could relate with their students and so I think that was a huge motivator for me it's I get to teach about my culture and my language and I get to bring culture and language to the school that maybe wasn't such a positive experience to begin with so that's wonderful that you are really again bringing that positive change right back to the environment that you initially came from now, some of you had touched on this next question very briefly, um, but I'd like to expand a little bit more. So Kelly, turning to you, what experience do you have working with different age groups? And can you share the challenges or benefits of working with certain groups and what preferences you found in the ages that you enjoy teaching the most? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of a lot of different experiences and teaching lots of different age groups, which was really helpful. So in the beginning, I started out teaching at the community college level where I would have students from age 18 to like 68, 78, you know what I mean? Like 88, and it was like this broad spectrum, you know? And then I also was teaching some summer classes to middle schoolers and little workshops for middle schoolers. And so, um, I kind of got a little taste for all those different age groups. And um, I, I never really thought of myself as teaching younger kids and didn't, was, haven't really had much attraction for that. But I was having a challenge at the um, community college level because it was such a broad age group that everyone from like a different background and different place and a different stage in their life and it just was a, like too many different kinds of people to juggle. Um, so later when I decided to get my teaching credential, I kind of focused more towards high school. And at least now my classes are more homogenous, like mostly juniors and seniors. And um, at first I was a little apprehensive because I was like, these high schoolers are gonna be a little grumps, you know, they're gonna be, and, 
but it, the more time I spend with them, the more I realize this is the perfect age group for me because it's kind of a little more closely aligned to my personality. Like I um, can be kind of goofy with them or I don't know. I just, my personality fits better with age. It kind of reminds me, my mom taught middle school and she just like understood that age group. Like I would, middle school would be like, poke this in my eye to spend the day with middle schoolers. But she loved them and just like understood their little, their little life at that age and so I kind of like started wide and sort of honed in to get more specific to like the targeted age group for me. That's great that you were able to have multiple different experiences and play different roles that that helped you narrow that down and that you were able to do it so that now you can spend the rest of your career working with the group that you really enjoy working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cecilia, let's turn to you for the same question. What experiences have you had with different groups and or like what preferences do you have for working with different age groups? Yeah, so I've worked with various grades ranging from second to 12. And I just wanna say that I admire K through five teachers so much because second grade was so tough for me. Um, quiet coyotes were my thing and I tried to bribe them a lot, but it just wasn't for me. It was just too much patience and I just had a really hard time. And then I kind of expanded with middle schoolers and. I felt comfortable, but I just didn't feel at home yet. Um, and then I ended up being placed um, during my student teaching at a high school, and I absolutely loved it. I loved working with 9 through 12th graders, and I just feel that I can make the most positive impact working with this age group because with them, I'm able to have and sustain meaningful conversations regarding our curriculum and just their shared lived experiences. So I feel like I'm able to do the most work with that age group. But like I said, I commend K through five teachers. I don't know how you do it, but I'm glad you're brave enough to stick it out because it is tough. <laughs> I don't know how they do it either. So I echo that. <laughs> Bianca, what about you? What have, what have been your experiences with the different ages? So I've also worked with K through 12, um, never done the, anything above that. So I commend you, Kelly, <laughs> on that. Um, I, I love all age groups, I have to say. Um, I love, I'm probably because I'm the mother of two. I love little kiddos, but I think one of the reasons I leaned more towards high school um, was because I have two kiddos at home. And so it's nice to be able to come home to my two little kiddos and kind of be a, a, a kind of a figure for them and then also have my kiddos my 160 kiddos in my classroom so um I really enjoy right now I teach a huge variety because I teach Spanish one two and three so that means I can get freshmen or I can get seniors um and right now I'm really loving teaching it's weird they're too drastic I love teaching my seniors my Spanish three because of the curriculum because they're so like immersed in the language and they have so many skills so they can do really cool things. And um, building off Cecilia, you're able to have these deep connections with them. And a lot of them, this is my third year with them because yeah. I'm the only teacher that teaches Spanish one, two, and three. So it's like, I had them as freshmen and now I have them as a junior or senior. But I also really love teaching freshmen, which some people kind of tell me, well, they're kind of crazy because they're coming into high school and they're they're new and they're kind of getting used to high school, but I love it. And I don't know if it's just because of my discipline, but um, teaching a, a second language and just kind of seeing the, I guess, the process of them going from knowing not one word of Spanish to at the end of the year, they can form these little sentences. It's exciting for me. So I really like freshmen, but I really enjoy seniors as well. And that sounds like something your students probably appreciate a lot, having an instructor that, that moves with them over the years instead of kind of like a one semester, or one year, and then moving on. So I'm sure they appreciate that just as much as you do. It's a perk for me as well. <laughs> all right, Kelly, we are coming back to you. So the next question I'd, I'd like to hear from you all on is, what have been some of the biggest challenges in your teaching career? And what are some of the greatest rewards of your teaching career? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's definitely the greatest rewards like that we've 
keep like repeating here over and over and over again is the connections you have like with your students. Like that is like the number one best part of my day. Is just like spending time hanging out with kids and talking to them. I guess the nice thing about my job is like uh, while we're working like in clay, it just like is so conducive to conversation. And so we talk about TV shows, and movies and life and jobs. And today we're talking about driving and taking the, you know, getting their license and, and you just get, you really get to know kids really well. And you like form really strong relationships with them over time. And like to the point where like when they graduate, then I let them like, um, friend me on social media like after they graduate and then we keep in touch long after and um, yeah that's what like everybody says like the number one best part is like the kids and that's why this year was so hard because it was like it was like the best part of school is not here <laughs> I miss them and um, I mean the other best part of my job is that I have so much freedom in the curriculum I create I mean, there is no textbook for me. I get to just make it up as I go and have having that freedom um, is really nice. Not have like these sort of like benchmarks to make like the math teachers do, you know, they're like, if you're not teaching the coil building by October, Kelly, you're behind. It's like, nobody cares. I can just like go at the pace that my students need. So I'm always like connecting with them. And anyway, and then the biggest drawbacks I would say of, of teaching is, oh boy, there's always something that, um, there's always, it seems like there's always something, somebody that's gonna try to kind of create little challenges. You know, there's always these flaming hoops that you have to jump through and they're a pain, um, you know, the, you know, the, but it's, it's kind of like worth it. I just think like, whatever, I'll jump through it if I can be with these kids, you know what I mean? And, and get to do what I like to do. And so there's always some weird standard or some goofy little thing or, you know, some annoying thing. And then you just have to like, just, just jump through it and move on. You know what I mean? Um, I, pretty vague, but I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. It, it's really cool to hear that in a career that allows you to be creative and help your students be creative, that you're also able to transfer that creativity to even like building your curriculum, like you were saying, and, and not being stuck with like a really um, rigid way to do things. Um, I'm sure that that probably jives with your creative self very well. All right, Cecilia, what about you? What have been um, maybe some expected or unexpected challenges of teaching and then expected or unexpected rewards? Yeah, so my most rewarding thing about teaching, I think Bianca already touched on it, is just being able to see their growth. So I teach English language development, and so I get some students who are new to the country and do not know not one thing about English, no numbers, uh, basic you know letters, nothing like that. So being able just to see their growth um, is so rewarding for me, and it reminds me of why like I decided to become an educator. But it also is like a motivating factor as to why I should remain in this profession. So aside from like the test scores and you know just all these assessments that they have to take, knowing that they went from being a shy student, not wanting to speak because they were embarrassed to a more resilient student who wants to have open conversations. So that's very rewarding for me. And I think the most challenging part about teaching in general is um, coping with secondary trauma and compassion fatigue. Like we talk about it, um, but as a new year teacher um, and as a first year teacher, it's kind of hard to, to really process that, especially when you're faced with your first, your first case. Um, coping through that and working through that is definitely very challenging. And I think that, you know, not only do we teach a vulnerable population, we teach adolescents and all of them come with us with various different backgrounds, but teachers ourselves, we're also a vulnerable population because 
um, we develop a rapport and relationship with these students that they begin to open up to us, right? They get to share all of their experiences and their trauma that they've been harboring. And then we have to find ways to kind of cope with that. And that was very challenging for me. Um, I learned that, you know, I had my first case where one of my students attempted to commit suicide earlier um, this month and well, March in March. And it was so hard for me to cope with that and just getting acclimated to the various resources and ensuring that our students are okay, especially during this pandemic is the most challenging thing right now. But um, having a community of people and your colleagues that really help and support you and letting your students know that they're cared for and loved is just what, you know, the best thing that you can do given our circumstances. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that has been incredibly challenging. And I know it is something that student staff and faculty alike in this session can relate to on some level or another. So um, again, I think your students are very lucky to have you there and, and willing to navigate those resources for them. Bianca, we'll go ahead and turn to you. What are what are some challenges and rewards that you'd like to share with us? Uh, I think building off of Cecilia, there there are. I think uh, uh, we do as educators. We we want to give as much as we can possibly give because that is just our natural nature. Um, the biggest challenge this year, I think, is figuring out how to be able to manage it all, like being able to manage all the preps, being able to manage home life, being able to manage your 160 kids, because those are my kids too. Um, and then finding a moment for yourself as a teacher. Um, that's been the biggest struggle for myself, as well as how Cecilia had mentioned, finding other teachers that you can feel comfortable and kind of break down with and kind of not necessarily break down, but just be able to talk with about it and know hey, there are other teachers who are going through this and it's not always going to be pretty. It's mm -hmm. not always going to be perfect. But finding time to take care of you has been a huge challenge. Um, I think this is the first year I'm starting to get better at it, um, mostly because I'm kind of taking down those walls and saying, you know what, it's okay for me to be having a rough day because we're human. We're all human. Um, other teachers are going through this as well. We're all going through this together. And so just being able to, to put down those walls and, and it's just been a struggle sometimes to manage it all. Um, but um, I think that's been my biggest challenge is just managing everything, home life, the multiple preps. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the, the issues that, you, that students bring to you, you put a lot on that, of that on yourself. Um, and and we always, we tend to forget about ourselves. So just trying to find time for you. Um, my highlight has definitely been, it's, it's kind of ironic, is having students come to me and feel comfortable to be able to open up to me. Because when I was in high school, I don't think I could think of one teacher that I could go to. And that was my whole goal as an educator is to become a teacher that these students could actually feel comfortable coming to. Um, and so for me, that's, it, it's kind of a highlight of my career because these kids feel comfortable coming into my classroom and talking to me. They feel safe. And that's, that's super important to me. That's the reason I became an educator. I wanted them to have a place that was safe for them to talk about their personal life, about friends, about family. And I also wanted them to have something that was, or a place that was relatable to them. So that's definitely been the highlight or just seeing students come back after they've graduated and they pop in your classroom. You see them with like their military year or you see them with like their school, like they update you about college. I think it's super awesome. That's always really fun too. So um, yeah, that's definitely my highlight. So. I would venture to say that some faculty members on this call might feel the same right now to see you all <laughs> popping in and the success that you've had in the meantime. All right, Kelly, let's round back to you. Um, our next question is, could you please share maybe one or two specific takeaways that you have from your Chico State experience that you feel have positively impacted you in your professional work? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wrote down like the number one is 
great faculty, <laughs> like the best. Like um, I had so many awesome teachers when I was at Chico, like Cam, um, who's here, Cam Crawford, Stuart Moore, Mike Murphy, Vernon Patrick, James Kuiper, Sherry Simons, Yoshia Kusaba, Eileen McDonald, um, and lots more, but I just like, they were so great. And when I, when it came time for me to teach, like when I got to teach my first drawing class, I immediately thought back to like, what did Vernon do? <laughs> like, what did, what did my teachers do? And so I modeled a lot of my like teaching style on based off of like, especially my Chico State faculty, more than my San Diego State faculty members. Like they had a, the biggest impact because they really gave us a lot of special attention, I felt, and made me feel special, like, and seen. And um, so I would say definitely like the faculty and making a strong connection with them. And then the other thing I wrote down was we had a lot of exhibition um, a lot of show, like a lot of opportunities to like show our work and install our work. Um, and we were, I felt like when I was there, we were always like putting together art shows, um, like with my classmates. And there were just lots of opportunities to do these kind of professional practices. And um, it was an opportunity to like, um, like, you know, we were making all this art and I was like, now it's like, I always equate it to sport, like making the arts like practice, but like showing it is like the game, you know? And so like, yeah, now we get to like, it had a reason to, we were doing all this work. And um, that's why I feel like in, ed in education, like I try to like really highlight their work at the end and show that like, okay, you did all this work and now we need to like really look at it and care about it and present it, have like an end. So those two things for sure. Thank you. I'm hearing a, a lot of recurring themes of, of being seen and valued and having your work being seen and valued. And I'm so glad that that's something you took away from Chico State. Cecilia, what are maybe one or two takeaways that you have carried on into your career? So basically paying back off of what Kelly said, I think just taking the time to meet really great professors and um, being able to create a rapport with them was just something that I did not have in high school. So when I was came to college as a first generation college student, I did not know anything. I was just like, oh, they're my professors. Like if I see them outside, I guess I'll wave. Like I didn't really know any better. I was just um, stuck in like, okay, I go to class, do my work and then just kind of leave. But um, taking the time to really get to know your professors was very helpful for me, especially as an undergrad. And it basically influenced my decision to continue and get my master's at Chico State and then um, my teaching credential too, um, because I just love the professors there. And I liked the dedication and time that they took, you know, to really help us grow. And um, yeah, I loved that. And because of them, I was just able to be exposed to various educational opportunities, job opportunities, and like mentorships. Even when I didn't think I was worthy of those opportunities, they reminded me and motivated me to keep pushing forward and, you know, let me know that I was worthy of it and I needed to be there. So I, I appreciate that because it really definitely helped me out. And I think the other piece would be just the various forms of literature that I was exposed to. I took a multicultural uh, literature class and various forms of, you know, classes that focus on various forms of literature. And that really helped me uh, shape like the type of curriculum that I want to share with my students, whether that's, you know, I don't know, maybe um, a text that's part of the canon or a more relevant text written by, you know, a young author or exposing them to young adult novels. So that was really helpful for me. And I've taken some of that and I've implemented it within my classroom as well. That's wonderful. And you know what you said about building those relationships with faculty members is something I know I echo to students all the time. I know folks in the Career Center echo to students have built these relationships, not just so that you can go ask for a letter of recommendation when you need it, but so you can also utilize these people as mentors and, and to grow and learn from their experiences. And 
it sounds like your students are going to be well on their way to doing that with you as well. All right, Bianca, what are a couple of takeaways that you had from your time at Chico State that have, have carried into your career and remained relevant? Uh, same here. My, the Spanish department at Chico State was absolutely incredible. Um, the whole reason I became a Spanish teacher and decided to be a Spanish teacher was because of, because of a specific professor, Sarah Anderson. Um, and she just, not just her, I mean, there are quite, there are quite a few others, um, but just the curriculum she brought into the classroom, the hands-on, I mean, I still do it in my class. My kids are, are writing children's books, they're karaoke, they're writing cheesy love songs. They're, we just, we do really fun hands-on projects that we did with Dr. Sarah Anderson, or we're telling, I don't know, we're telling really fun stories in Spanish and talking about different cultures in Spanish. It's just, it's really interactive. It's project-based and it's basically what I was taught during my whole entire undergraduate studies. It's how my professors presented it to me and modeled it to me that now I'm able to do that in my classroom. Um, so I think everything that they've, that they showed me that that was done in my learning experience, I've been able to, to bring it to my own classroom and grow and learn from them. And the other huge takeaway was that these professors didn't just become my professor. Um, as Cecilia said, it wasn't just, oh, they're just, you know, your teacher, your professor. It was, I still to this day, I mean, I'll go meet up with Dr. Anderson and we'll go have coffee and we'll check in with each other. And, and I just genuinely know I have a safe spot with her. And it's, it's like they become just this really close mentor that, that you look up to and, but you can also, you can also open up to them and continue to open up to them for the rest of your career. And they can help you building your career and in your personal life. So it's those two takeaways. It's, it's, it's my classroom is, is like thriving with projects, lots of fun curriculum, and that's relevant to my kids. Um, and then it's also that, that whole idea that I have a safe space, safe space with my professor, and I can also give that to my students now. That's great to hear that you maintain that relationship. I was going to say, it's unfortunate she's not on the call, but I'm going to have to give her an email and say, hey, you got talked up today, but it sounds like you do yeah. maintain contact. Yeah. Well, I was just texting her last night about that. <laughs> so I'll have to send her one. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, our next question that I'd like to ask you all is what activities do you engage in to keep yourself learning, growing professionally, and just ready for the next step in your career? Okay. And Kelly, you can go ahead and kick off on that one. I'm ready. <laughs> um, okay, the number one thing that helps me, especially it's kind of ceramic specific, but at the same time, maybe not, um, you know, it probably applies more broadly is, um, Every, about every year, uh, I do a workshop um, with a professional, like a professional artist will like give a technical workshop and um, they'll talk about their work and they'll show a new technique or, you know, show their slides and talk about their ideas. And um, I'll either do it in person or I did some online now because people are doing much more online workshops or they're like um, these, um, professional craft schools like Penland, Watershed, Haystack, um, Anderson Ranch, um, which is kind of like sleepaway camp for art. <laughs> um, and you know, I'll take a workshop where I'll learn a new technique and then that'll inspire a project um, or a tech, you know, in class. And it also helps me um, kind of like solve problems that happen that arise in class I have like way more tools in my tool bag um but that is like probably the number one thing because I'll see something in a workshop and then I'll use it like um a lot and other things I wrote were conferences um whether it be for education or ceramics but for me the more specific your content area is the more helpful like the education ones are yeah okay but not great. Um, and then other places things are just like, um, if a project might 
go well, but not great. I won't just throw it out. I'll like redo it, like do it again next year or do it again the next semester and make, and make adjustments. So like by the third time you do a project with a group of kids, it's usually better. And so I don't, if it doesn't go great, I don't, wouldn't totally throw it out. I would just like keep improving on it, write some notes. But if it is a really bad one, then do throw it out, you know? So um, kind of like, that's the best part of teaching too, I tell kids, is you get a do-over. It's like, okay, that was a okay year, but it's over. And then you get a nice little summer break and then you get a full do-over year to like retry that thing and see if it sticks, you know? You know, as, as cyclical as the academic year can feel sometimes, it is always a nice fresh start coming back. And that's great to hear that you hold on to those projects and I'm sure you're you're growing and learning how to teach right along with your students. So that's, I think that's a great example applicable across all different kinds of fields that you don't just give up, you, you take a break, you revisit, you improve. All right, Cecilia, what do you do to keep yourself learning and growing professionally? So aside from what Kelly just mentioned, like going to workshops, that is very helpful. I think the first question I asked during my like interview process when I got hired at Live Oak High School was like, am I allowed? Like, what do we do to encourage or just to let our teachers grow professionally? And um, my administrator gave me a whole list of things that they do. But for me, from what I have learned, I learn better when I collaborate with my colleagues, um, which was a very challenging thing to do at the beginning because I wasn't sure as a, you know, first, um, as a first year teacher, I was very just kind of awkward about it. I wasn't sure how or with who. And because um, at Live Oak, we don't really have a big English language development program. Um, it kind of just cuts everything down to like, you know, smaller groups and we do not have PLCs. So it made it very difficult to try to meet up and collaborate. But once I figured that out and once I gathered like a little community of um, ELD teachers, it worked out fine. Um, we plan together, um, we meet every Monday. Well, for the most part, every Monday. And we talk about just, you know, the lessons that we are doing, we share strategies. Um, and lots of gadgets right now with, you know, just having to teach virtually or hybrid or however it is you're teaching, um, learning and exposing yourself to various different, you know, just third party applications, extensions is very helpful. Um, that's how I got in touch with Pear Deck and other, you know, just um, used tools. Uh, and I started to incorporate them in my classroom. And because uh, all of our, well, my entire little group of teachers were also doing it too. We got to meet and, and talk about like, hey, did you, did you use Pear Deck like this? Or how about Cami or Flipgrid, which ended up helping me a lot. Um, and I feel like it made me become a dynamic and, you know, just more engaging teacher. Um, so that's been really helpful. And also just being online on social media, um, I know Twitter is really big on, you know, collaborative communities. Um, so I've been slowly making my way through Twitter and finding communities that I feel comfortable participating in and those that I feel that I can get the most out of. That's really great that you found sort of that creative way to bring a community of teachers together. I know conferences are a lot of, in a lot of fields, sort of the go-to professional development, but they cost money usually involve travel. So like finding something very local where you can learn and grow from each other is a wonderful way to utilize your resources. All right, Bianca, what about you? Um, my biggest, I guess, help in my profession, my growth has been, um, we have this organization, it's called CLTA. So it's very specific to my department to teaching Spanish or just teaching a world language. And I, I'm pretty sure every different subject should have their own like affiliates for for their subjects, but it's been extremely helpful. Like we have a we have the northern affiliate, which is called Flash. And I actually was placed into this when I was undergraduate at Chico State because of our professors. And it was kind of like a requirement by our professors, like, check this out, go to this. 
and it's been incredible because it's like Disneyland for a Spanish teacher. So mm -hmm. it's like we meet once every semester, typically, or we even have newsletters going out with all kinds of new stuff. And it's so much fun because it's just all these language teachers get together and we sometimes we get speakers to come and they're just these gurus in language acquisition. And it's so much fun. It, it really feels like Disneyland for me as a teacher, as a Spanish teacher. Of course, math would probably be like, what is this? this is, you know, but as a Spanish teacher, it's, it's incredible. And I feel like other departments should have something similar. So I would really look into like, what is the organization that can help me grow um, according to whatever my discipline is? Because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure each discipline has their specific organization. Again, mine's very subject specific. Ours is Flash. And so that's been so much fun because it's not only a bunch of material that's being thrown out at you. It's a bunch of teachers that are in your discipline come together and you guys all get to have fun doing these activities that you would do in your classroom and you get to be silly. You get to practice them there. And so that's been, that's been super helpful for me. Um, the other one is at my school, there are two Spanish teachers. So it, it, it does make it hard to PLC sometimes or to just get an expanded view of what is going on in different world language classrooms. So I've been very, very proactive about keeping in contact with all the teachers that I meet at these flash conferences. And so we're constantly sharing stuff, even if it's like I'm working with the Chico High teacher or the PV High, PV teacher or Oroville teacher. So I've, I've basically created these bonds with these other language teachers so that I can know, hey, what's going on in your classroom or what's going on over here, even though we're not at the same high school. Um, so that's been really, really helpful as well. You know, Bianca, I have to thank you because you just gave me the perfect plug for the next event in this series, which is the Art of Networking on Wednesday, April 14th. So everyone, please heed the advice and attend the Art of Networking event next week. But thank you, that, that was really good. I, I'm sure every field does have their own professional organizations and getting engaged in those is so valuable. All right, we are approaching about the last 15 minutes of the session. So I'd like to open the floor to any staff, faculty, students who would like to ask questions, say hello, if you have any comments, um, feel free to raise your hand, use the chat or simply unmute yourself. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll weigh in briefly. Hi, Cecilia. Um, <laughs> um, in, in regards to this, the um, what Bianca was just saying, yeah, um, another, there's, there's an organization called the California Subject Matter Projects, um, which is specific to California. And there's a subject matter project in art. There's one for um, world languages. There's one for writing. There's one for reading and literature. Um, they're all, and they're, and they're supposed to be within reach of every teacher in the state. And they are really, um, I used to direct the Northern California Writing Project one. And it's, and the idea behind these is really about teacher, um, teacher leadership. Um, so the, the way that these organizations, what they do is they ask practicing teachers to share what works with other teachers, um, rather than coming in and sort of saying, let me tell you how, you know, what you're doing wrong or something like that. We, we know that um, these organizations know that you have a wealth of knowledge and just want to put smart people in the same room together to share. So, um, so yeah, that, that kind of work is, is super valuable. Um, it's, you know, it's kept me in touch with practicing teachers from kindergarten through college or through college, which helps me as someone who works in English education um, know the things that are happening in classrooms. So yeah, I just I just love that, to hear that you're also like trying to do those things and find your people and because that's the way to sort of sustain yourself because um, teaching can be so isolating. But you guys all sound like you're doing such a great, great stuff. So it's just really lovely to hear from all three of you. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else have any questions, comments? I'll just jump in. I just wanted to say, oh my gosh, it, it just made my heart so proud to see you all. And, and hey, Celia, how you doing? And 
I, it's, it's just so lovely to hear about the great experiences that you've had in the college and the kind of work that you've been doing and even the extent to which you've been maintaining uh, relationships with, with your faculty and your, your mentors from when you were a student. And Bianca, I want to talk to you before you leave. Okay. Okay. Um, but um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your time with us and, and for just really coming back and, 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 and being willing to, to share your experiences with, with students and, and providing this information for them. So thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. <laughs> I have a question for Cecilia. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you always knew that you wanted to teach ELD or if you were ever debating between teaching English. Yeah, so great question. Um, I thought originally I wanted to stick with English and that's the path that I was going towards. And when I graduated at Chico State as an undergrad and I received my bachelor's, um, I worked a lot with um, just my professors and Maris Thompson, and because of her, like she was able to squeeze me in into the Rise program. Um, so it's like a residency in secondary education, although their name changed. I think I believe now they're CLAD, but at the time um, she squeezed me in, and when I was doing the master's portion, I was developing a research question and. I unknowingly formed my research question on um, the English learner population and I was working with them. And when I did all of that, I began to grow a love for that certain population. And I realized that I wanted to work with them. So it wasn't something I initially thought about, but once I was exposed to, and once I did the research and I began to interact more with you know, that population, I just developed a love for the form. And because of that, I chose to continue. Um, but aside from teaching ELD at Live Oak High School, I also have all the weird extra classes like an English intervention. I have like an AVID 11 class, which is like um, an elective that prepares students for college. So, you know, it, it works out fine, but the population that I do teach in Live Oak High School, because we don't have that many English learners, um, it's really small. So I only have 45 students, but um, because it's so small, I'm able to develop a great rapport with them. So yeah, no, I didn't originally intend to. I was sticking with English and then I kind of just fell into it, but I wouldn't regret it. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've learned that sometimes our emphasis areas find us as much as we find them. It sounds like that's echoed as well. Yes. Do we have any other questions from our audience members? Okay, I'll, I can ask a question or okay. I have a question. Okay. So you all have talked a little bit about some of the pre-professional activities you engage with. Kelly talked about um, exhibiting work and I know Cecilia did some things. Could you, for, for students who might later see the video, for students who are on the call, could you talk about some of the, the things that you did while you were a student to help prepare you for your career? Yeah, okay, I'll get it going. Yeah, so when I, um, while I was a student at Chico, um, I did, they had a, like an internship program through like 1078 gallery, that I did and so I that was sort of like intro to like work like you know curating or preparing a gallery space and stuff so kind of like an intro to like the art world kind of thing um and then I also worked at the James Nidal Fine Art Gallery too, um for a short time so it kind of at first like I started out being more interested in doing gallery work and so I did have some jobs like working in gallery at Chico, but then after, after Chico, then I started working in like high schools and colleges and kind of going more into like educational jobs. But I don't know, you just, there's, it's, you'll be surprised. You just apply for jobs. They might fall in your lap, you know, you gotta apply. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I agree. Um, while I was figuring out what I wanted to do and making my way into the credential program, I was working at Sutter Dining Hall at that time. And um, I just felt like I wasn't getting the most out of, you know, like I wasn't engaging enough with um, just students that are part of K through 12 education. I just felt like I was very secluded working on campus and with food. So I decided to venture out and I became a reading tutor. And then from there, um, Kim Jackson actually recruited me to become a writing mentor and that really helped me out. And it allowed me to work just in an educational setting and um, work with students, um, even though I myself was a student as well. But I really loved it because I got the opportunity to take on a small little cohort of, of students. I think there were like 10 or 15 in my group. So I was able to practice like classroom management even before stepping into my own physical classroom. So that was really great. And just being there to support them um, and being part of their writing and, and their process was really helpful for me because not only was I trying things out and venturing you know, into uncharted territories on my own, but I was also taking notes like, ooh, this one thing worked out or, Ooh, this one thing that Kim Jackson did was so great. Like I might want to do it too. So I agree. I think exposing yourself to job opportunities that are in the realm of education is a great thing to do because you'll start developing all these skills that you will need when you're alone with 28 kids in your own classroom and you're trying to navigate everything. So it's really helpful. Uh for me, uh, I think I've always been in education since I left high school. I actually, I worked for the after school program for years and I actually did take um, some time, time off of college. It took quite a few, few years. Um, and even during that time, I was constantly being surrounded around kids. I've always solely worked around kids or in education because I've always worked in either the after school program or now as a teacher. So um, that was huge because I don't know if any of you have ever had the chance to work for an after school program, but I mean, you get thrown in with kids and it's kind of like you're a teacher, but after school. And so you, you build a lot of skills doing that. And so I was, I did after school, obviously for, for younger kids, um, which is why I think I decided honestly to go into high school. I loved it, but, um, but once I actually took an internship that was through Chico State, I kind of figured out, hey, I really like high school. The, the internship actually placed me at Chico High and I got placed with an incredible mentor teacher. She was incredible, which she wasn't my mentor teacher yet, but it's actually how I was placed in there during the credential program because of this internship that was also in Dr. Anderson's class. It's Spanish 425, I still remember it. Um, and I felt like, wow, I'm already getting to do all this stuff because the mentor teacher I was placed with, she kind of just let me do what I wanted to do. And she let me experiment. She let me have fun with the kids and kind of start doing my own plans. And so it was a, it was a class that kind of helped me figure out like classroom management, how to apply different learning strategies or teaching strategies that you wanted to do for second language acquisition. Um, so it was just, yeah, I just, I just had quite a few opportunities before even going into the credential program that kind of helped me get to where I am now. It really sounds like internship opportunities or related job experience have been invaluable for you all. And, and I think that is echoed across everything we tell our students, all the alumni we've talked to, or just get yourself out there do something related to where you think you want to go and, and you'll, your path will start getting directed from that point forward. So I'm glad to hear that in your all experience as well. Okay, any other questions from anyone? Yeah, um, I just wanted to thank you um, three for um, you know giving us a little bit of insight in the educational field. Um, it kind of like reassures me that that's something that I do want to continue to, um, you know, work towards. And um, I just had a question. So I know you guys said like, that there's a lot of, um, you know, obstacles that you guys have to go through. Um, and I kind of wanted to see how you guys went through, you know, being in a virtual setting, you know, like this is just like, it was just like a really different change for um, 
for you know not only students but educators so i wanted to see like how you guys um, manage that throughout the throughout your experience hmm. okay um so what i did this year so we spent our first half the year was full virtual and right now i'm in hybrid and um for full virtual like to be honest like before we were going into it i was really scared i was like i don't know how i'm going to be able to handle like all of it you know like planning and teaching and you know just juggling you know like you're saying the life work balance of it like people are working crazy hours to get it all done so um what we decided to do like as a department the art department we divided and conquered and so we said all the, our beginning classes will be like a wheel where i developed a lesson and planned it and then and then gave it to the other two teachers and then they developed lessons and like shared it with me and so all of our beginners like were doing the same thing for that first semester and it was like they got a little bit of ceramics and a little bit of art and a little bit of like woodworking and it was um and it just kind of like lightened the load you know just by collaborating with co-workers and making it happen and then now in full virtual it was like okay starting back to square one and we're doing and i'm like okay we're doing nothing but ceramics we're not doing the wheel anymore and the kids were like good and <laughs> I don't know, you just kind of like, I was like, it's going to be a crawl, walk, run, where we're going to start crawling, and then we're going to walk, and then we're going to, by the time we're done, we'll be running. And so, it, you know, we just started square one, and I'm like, here's how we're going to do this. And I literally, I was always going like this when I was talking to the kids. I was like, I'm figuring it out as we go. I think it's going to be like this, and da, da, da. And there was a lot of, like, head grabbing and scratching. But the kids were cool. They just kind of, they understand. They're like, we're rolling with it. And I think just being really genuine has always been my thing where I'm like, this is the truth. This is 100%. You know? And they'll, they're pretty accommodating. Yeah. So kind of the same as Kelly. But I think no one really expected us to be able to teach in a pandemic. Like when you become a teacher, no one tells you like, get ready to teach in a pandemic, you know, and with all those challenges that come. So I definitely, you have to learn as you go, but computer literacy skills, I am so thankful that I'm like well versed in Google because I have seen teachers who, you know, have been teaching for several years, not even know how to work Google Classroom. So um, taking the time to really know how to navigate various applications was really helpful for me. But I think in terms of like myself and, and the educator that I am, it, I had to focus more on the process versus the end goal. Like I did not care that we only got to one page or half a page, like that's fine. I'll deal with it when I have to, but the process that it took to get there, like, were we all sharing? Were we on Zoom? Were we engaging? Were we using the chat? Um, that's been the very, like, I think key takeaway for me is focus more on the process and the work that your students had to do to get there versus how much did you actually get done um, at the end? Because, you know, if we can speed through a whole page, that's great. But what did the students get out of it? Were they engaging? Were they in tune with the content? So that has been really helpful. For myself, um, so we started, I'm over in Gridley, we started virtual and then on October, we went completely back, um, like no restrictions. And so Gridley was completely back and that was a chaotic mess. Um, we had about half our kids gone for two or three weeks. So at first it was like, we had teachers saying, well, we gotta get them here, we gotta get them there. And it was just, I guess I just had to make a call for myself and say, you know what? If I'm stressed, my kids, my students are probably way, way up here. So I kind of had to just make a call for my own students and for my, my sanity and for my kids' sanity and say, you know what? We're going to take it slow. I need to make sure that my kids, first of all, are, are mentally okay, that we're there for each other. They'll get to where they need to be. It'll be my job later on. We'll, we'll work together. But number one is let's be there for our kids. 
you know, there were weeks that I had half my kids, we were all physically supposed to be there, but in my classes, half the kids were gone because they were in quarantine. So it's been kind of a disaster <laughs> when it comes to that, um, because we go from virtual to full on in person. So it was, it was a challenge, but I kind of just had to slow down. And I think I just had to be nice to myself and say, this is okay. It's not forever. This is temporary. We'll get through it. We'll get through it together. And I think that's what we did. And, and I've noticed that my kids, they just, this is the first year I think that kids just really feel that my students feel super, super supported because it's not about the curriculum so much. And maybe if I was a math teacher, I'd be saying different because I got to get them here. But I do have so much more liberty to kind of say, hey, it's okay if we don't get to preterit, which past tense in Spanish. It's okay. We don't have to do that. It's fine. We'll get there next year. We'll be fine. So my curriculum does give me that flexibility, but I had to be really nice with myself and say, hey, it's okay. We can slow down. Self-care is super important and that work-life balance is hard, but I feel like that's a professional skill that we hone right along with everything else that we learn. All right, everyone, um, with that last question that is going to conclude today's panel, I want to thank our three panelists once again for joining us, for taking the time to give back to your Chico State community. I know I appreciate it. I know all of our continuing students appreciate it. Um, we hope to bring you back for another event in the future. If you're willing, we'll certainly be in contact. Um, but until then, take care and good luck with your teaching ventures. Mm -hmm. I miss you so much. <laughs> like, I love you, Chico. I miss you. <laughs> Sending kisses. <laughs>